Welcome to The Point of View. It's your favorite current affairs show on City TV. Here we get the right guests on the relevant topics. We ask them good questions. You get some useful insights. And we have a two-in-one show for you tonight. Two big topics. Later in the show, we'll be talking about the Ghana Football Association as we count down to election of not just president, but executive council members. I have one of the forerunners to talk to us about his campaign and how he intends to change Ghana football. But before that, we'll be del delving into a very controversial matter. If you want to get in touch with us, uh, send us a WhatsApp message on the number on the screen. If you are watching on social media, we have a hashtag, the point of view. When we come back, I'll tell you who my first guest is and how we're going to proceed. So on the first part of the point of view today, we're going to um, try and respond to complaints put out by hundreds of former customers of Gold Coast. And these are aggrieved customers who say their monies have been locked up. They, have, they held a demonstration yesterday. Scores of them protested vehemently against what they call government neglect. In fact, some even accused the government of being in bed with the management of Gold Coast. I have the spokesperson for Gold Coast in studio, and I'm going to ask him questions directly from customers, past and present. Kofi Afra is here. Great to see you. Thank you, Bernard. Good to be on your show. Wow. You, you've come with a lot of documents. What's that? Oh, it's just um, some evidence of some of the payments we've been making over time. Wow. And, uh, so these are people's names and list of people you've names. paid? Names phone numbers, uh, bank details that we've paid. I have the, the main things actually with me wow. in soft copy. But just to show you that these mm. are... When people say we are not making any payments, it is, it is not true. It is, it is not factual. Okay, you know, and let's, are, let's, let's see what that. people are saying. Okay. So yesterday, Freeman Dunyami was... Um, she walked over 20 kilometers <laughs> with the protesters. First, they went to the finance ministry. They eventually ended up at the Jubilee House. Here's a flavor of what some of the customers said to her during that long walk. Yeah, my name is Simon Ohini. I am one of the leaders of the aggrieved customers of Gold Coast Fund Management. Okay, so which group is this? Is this just um, customers in Accra? W which group is this? No, the group is all over the country. It's all over the country, from the north, all over the country. That's what, is, that's what you are seeing now. All right, so... How many times have you demonstrated and what has been the results of your demonstration? How many times have you demonstrated in demand of your locked up investment and what has been the response so far? Look, severally, we demonstrated severally and without any responses. Okay, so we are, we are lost as to what is happening. So we need to press home our demand. So today we are asking a few questions. Why is the government quiet? Okay, people are thinking that the government is in bed with Kwasi Hindu and SEC. That's why they are quiet. Okay, that's what we are thinking. And so, secondly, they are thinking, we are thinking that there is no political benefit that the government will get. Uh, because when you look at DKM, when our current president was in opposition, he quickly addressed the DKM customers that he will pay. But why is it that he's quiet on this? He hasn't gotten any political benefit in this. And thirdly, um, uh, why is, are they trying to protect only the rich? So it looks what, like do you, what, do you, what do you mean by that? It's, it's like the rich will facilitate or pro, uh, uh, finance their political activities. So when it comes to the uh, rich, they don't care. They will leave him. They will protect them. <laughs> Several, several complaints we lodged with the regulator, that's Treaty Sanation Commission, have fallen into their ears. They have shown very little interest in compelling GCFM to meet their obligations towards their customers. And therefore, we have lost faith in the regulator to address our concerns. We believe the regulator will compromise any investigations and add it into this matter, saying they are equally complicit in this matter. We are therefore calling on your high office to relieve the Director General, Reverend Ogbaa of SEC, of his duty 
with immediate effect. You see, the president is for us. We have petitioned him over a year now. No one is talking. Yes, I mean, yes, I'm in the This time around, we want either the president, the vice president, or the chief of staff. Either than that, here belongs to all of us. We are law abiding. We have comported ourselves. We are going to continue to comport ourselves. If it comes that we should sleep here for three days before the president will be ready to receive our petition, we are ready to do that. I sincerely disagree with you. I have the full mandate of the president to collect this uh, petition. And I assure you, believe you me, I've been in government for long, that I will deliver same, unadulterated, unopened to my superior, that is the president. But I will urge you, in all earnest, to have complete trust in me and make sure and uh, believe you me that I will deliver same, like I've said, to the president. So that was Dr. Kwekwefi receiving the petition at the Jubilee House. So this was initially the walk to Jubilee House. Now let me show you uh, some of what the aggrieved customers said, some of whom say they came from as far as Oboise and other places to Accra to be part of the protest. Everything has gone down. Everything, everything, everything. And I'm from Oboise. Everything is gone. Everything. Because I have to use the same money to take care of the children. It's not only my money is there, my husband too. So it's like both of us, we are down at this moment. So this time I'm just pleading and asking the government to intervene. Because at this moment, we are dying. We are dying. And hospital, children's school fees, and then the other things. So we are dying. We are really dying. Pensioners are dying. 70% of our customers are pensioners. I don't want to mention names here. I swear God, I know three people who pass on because of this issue. I swear God, I'll never swear God for nothing. I'm a Muslim. I know what my religion I mean, says about you swearing. I just started last year. Last year, I can't get my principal not even talk of interest. Where is the, can I even think of interest again? Now I just need what I've invested. I don't need interest. They should just give me my money. A lot. My wife had a miscarriage out of this. I visit a private hospital whenever she's pregnant. But because of this thing, where can I get money to take her to the private hospital? I was compelled to rely on the normal, I mean, health service. And the result was what? I don't even want to talk about it again. So the, the government is aware of this problem. No, it is the government that is causing this problem, not Indum. The government to come in right now, take our petition. If uh, well, I'm the chief of staff can come, deputy, uh, 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 vice president, Whoever, whoever that is in government, take our petition. Listen, we have petitioned SEC because we know they regulate this uh, uh, company. But to say, sorry, uh, we will talk to you tomorrow. No respect. No, no, no. They're as if SEC is dead. So for me, if you ask me what's on my mind, the government, SEC and Christendom are sleeping on one bed. All right, so personally, how has this affected your life? Hey, look at my condition. Every month, at least every month, I have to go to the hospital. Tell me. How, how, on, on an average, how much do you spend when you go to the hospital? My consultation fee alone is 300 Ghana cities because the national health insurance doesn't work. work. It doesn't, my daughter. Kofi, why, why have you put Ghanaians through this? Why? Ben, um, once again, thank you for the opportunity. But we haven't put Ghanaians through this. There are circumstances that has brought this about, right? But... Even in the midst of that, we are taking every step necessary to deal with the situation. We've already told people, look, we've invested these monies in different projects, some in government agency-related projects, some in private invest with private companies, others with financial institutions. We are taking all of those investments back so that we can pay. So, yes, the problem is there. But we are also making the needed and necessary arrangements to, to, to get so these what, money what back. is really the problem? Is it that people owe you, they are not paying, or that you did investments that failed? What, what is the, what's the, what's the problem? The problem is the inability to get all the funds you're looking for at the same time. As it is now, if you look at the history of the company, this particular product has run for well over 15 years. And I can tell you for a fact, we invested well over 14 billion cities in government-related projects. 14 billion throughout the country. Schools, roads, etc. This is Gold Coast. Yes, Gold Coast. 
over 14 billion cities in this economy directly through financing and pre-financing of these contracts that government gives to contractors. So it's something we've been doing over the period. And then we get payments to, to make to our customers as and when the payments come through. But you've, you have a situation where for well over a period of almost two years, you're not getting any significant payments coming through from some of these government agencies. Mind you, there are some of the projects that were suspended, some of the projects that is, uh, on audit was supposed to have been done on it and all of that. So payments that should ordinarily have come, haven't come through. There are other challenges we've had with some of the private investors or private entities as well because of the difficulties in the economy as well. So they haven't been able to pay money that they should be paying on a regular basis to us as well. There are financial institutions that have gone down, okay, where we haven't been able to access all the funds that we may have placed with those entities. So it's a, it's a multiple... Or it's but a my, multiple understanding, my understanding of the business of fund management is that the value you offer is the prudence of your investment. Yes. And that prudence includes the right mix, the right type, yes. and the right risk profile. Yes. So if after 15 years of business, we've come to a stage where your monies have been locked up for whatever reason, mm -hmm. does that not undermine the quality of the work you were doing at, at Gold Coast, i.e., you did wrong investments? Ben, and that, that's why people can't get their money back. Ben, there is no company that can run successful for 15 years. 15 continuous years, even for this product. The company is over 26 years. 15 continuous years investing well over, just take even government projects alone, 14 billion. What is your, you what, saying, what is, what is your overall exposure? How much money? Uh, if you are looking at the principal and accrued interest, it's about 2 billion cities that we are expecting government to pay. Not government as in, but the what agencies of government. What percentage of your money is with government? If you look at the numbers, well over 60%. Are you serious? Yes, what well type over 60%. Of, what type of government? There, there, are, there are numerous projects. Look, we funded projects that, that are related to get Fund. We funded ones related to the Ministry of Finance itself. Ones related to Cocoa Board. But do, well. are, do, fund management do fund management companies invest in projects? I know they buy government paper. They buy bonds. They buy stocks. Typically. Mm -hmm. So to say you did get fund projects, if mm -hmm. somebody brings their pension funds to you to manage for them, yes. do you use it to uh, fund a contractor's get fund project? Is that how it's done? Bernard, when, when you talk about fund management, it's not just buying government papers. I mean, no economy can survive if, if that was all that we're doing. There are private entities, private sector entities, that are also providing a service not just to the nation, but the people of the nation as well. How do they get support? So you are saying 60% of your advances or your investments were in government-related projects? Yes. And we've, look, we've done that... Uh, Directly listen, to government or for people to do government projects? When somebody gets a contract from government, the person needs to look for money to execute it. And I'm saying that... But are you a bank? You are not a bank. Hold on. So why do you give money to somebody there, to do a there, project? If, if, as we talk, we are saying that we have well over 2 billion cities with government. It will be Directly. invested through the contractors. And that is why I'm happy that government says they are going to pay. So hopefully, the contractors that we, who are indebted to us, would also get part of the money and we'll get the money back. But um, there is a point that I'm making. When you invest 14 billion cities and you've been able to get all of that back and you have only an outstanding of 2 billion, you cannot say we're impudent. You get what I'm saying? We've done this successfully so, for well so over 15 you, years. You, 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 you mean you. Government owes you two billion cities. You owe two billion cities. Already, the uh, interim payment certificates are with government. They are working on it. We are aware. They are working on it. And hopefully, we, can, we should be able to come to a quick resolution on this. How, many, how that, many customers do you have? In total, we have 68,000 customers. How many have you paid? We've paid almost 9,000 customers. What's the, the, so, the, the 58,000 left, how much do you owe them? If you look at the numbers, the 58,000 left, uh, give and take... It's about $3 billion in total. If you look at the principal amount and then the interest are accruing. If you look at and the principal so amount you, you alone, owe, you owe it's about people, $1.4. You Just owe them but plus interest, $3 billion. Yeah, so if you're looking at even just the principal, it's about $1.4 billion. So assuming the government even were to pay the half of the $2 billion to us, you could actually wipe, off, wipe out almost everybody. But government doesn't owe you directly. You say government owes people you give monies to. Look... 
as long as you see when the payments come but the how payments do you know if government names. has paid the person no but when you get a contract and you come for pre financing we go to the agency that awarded you the contract right and so the checks that are written the payment checks are written in the joint names of the company and then the entity that won the contract so when people invest with you did you tell them that you will give some of their money to contractors to do government projects it's is a is a is a whole portfolio that we invest in it's a yeah, whole but, portfolio, but by portfolio that we invest in. you have a usually you have a a note from your investor telling you where they put the money. So, for example, if you buy, yes. if you do the balance fund from one of these people, they will say part of this is stocks, yes. part of this is yes. government bonds yes. in this ratio yes. with this risk portfolio. This is what you should expect. So, I'm surprised you're saying some of the people were contractors. It's a mixed bag of investments. We don't do just one. It's also part of risk management. So, it's a mixed bag of investment that you make. And you explain to the customer that these are the investments that we are putting your funds in. So the, as long the, as the, as if, the SEC, yes. the SEC, a few months before this happened, issued a circular asking fund management companies to stop doing guaranteed return Returns. investment. There's a view that Gold Coast was doing that. We were offering what you would term a fixed term uh, investment. But even then, you would tell the customer that the rates would change. So if you look at the, the rates or the returns over the period, they've never been the same over the period. It fluctuates. Normally, it's an average of about 3 to 4% above the treasury bill rates. Is, if you look it, at is the that profile. the type of business a fund management company should be doing? Well, if you are investing, you should have a benchmark. Normally, the benchmark is a 91-day treasury bill. And then you look at the risk profile and so what other uh, risk that you build into it. That is why you find that a private sector entity may borrow in the market for maybe 20%, but government can then borrow for less than that. Because government is seen as less, less riskier than an individual or private entity. You understand? So you'll find that the returns we're making were above what the government treasury bills were offering. Because obviously, as a private entity... They did not contribute they, they to your problems. No, no, I mean... Providing a guaranteed return. But we did not provide a guaranteed return. That's what I'm saying, that you have the benchmark of treasury bill, and then you build a risk uh, premium over that. So once your treasury bill rates change, you see that the entire rate changes as well. That is how it works. So if you look at the profile and, of the investment we've made and the returns, they've never been the same. It fluctuates. They've never been the same. So your, your largest exposure was to government? The largest is to government. But, but not directly, but, indirectly. But, but shouldn't government be actually safer than for everybody else? Well, the government has denied some of the columns you made. Remember, well, Umaru Sanda interviewed Gideon Boako, who categorically debunked some of the claims you made about the cause of your demise as a company. This was for your bank. Mm -hmm. So, he is, and if you permit me to read part of the things he said, Government spokesperson for the uh, 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 vice president spokesperson has rejected claims that government's indebtedness to GN Savings and Loans caused a collapse. I know it's a different company. Mm -hmm. Now he says, Mr. Boakon rubbish claims by Dr. Indum that government failure to pay contractors who owed him caused his company's demise. Now this is interesting. Gold Coast says people who did business with government are owed mm -hmm. and therefore it affects you. Mm -hmm. GN Savings and Loans is saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So for both the fund management company and the bank, mm -hmm. your largest exposure was to people who were doing business with government? For, I cannot speak for the bank in terms of what their exposure is to government, but I can speak for Gold Coast. And I'm saying that, look, the, the factual, there are factual inaccuracies in what the gentleman speaks about. I don't know who he is, but there are factual inaccuracies. As I talk to you, I haven't you even are quoted aware, anything he said yet. As, as I talk to you, you are aware that there are court cases we've already initiated against the Ministry of Finance and some contractors, against the, the Ministry of Roads and some contractors. You are aware of that. I mean, why would anybody in his right sense come and accuse government of owing okay. when the person doesn't owe you? So It, one it of wouldn't the, make sense. One of your customers has called him, before I put him on, just a yes. final thought. Three billion is what you owe your customers at Gold Coast. Yes. Dr. Andrew released a list of 4,200 firms that owe him 423 million. So this would be for both Gold Coast, Group Indum, and everything else. Possibly. So there's still a difference there. Because if you, you are exposed to people, 3 billion, mm -hmm. your founder says people owe him 422 million. Yes. It means that at least 
2.6 billion is unaccounted for. Mm -hmm. Where is that money? But that is why I said that there are some that you have with some of the banks that have collapsed, for example. There are some. But he mentioned it in the list. The same. His I'm list not sure was, you'll find. It, it was 4,206 firms. Yes, but I'm not sure you'll find any of that in there as well. There are actually entities who should ordinarily have been here, but who had come forth with a payment plan, for example. So they will ordinarily not be here as well. So you have to take that okay. one out before you get the, the correct figure. Let's hear from one of your customers, Simon okay. Ohini. He was at the demonstration yesterday. Simon, good evening. Hello, Simon. Can you hear me? Yeah, but it's faint. Eh? It's faint. You are live on air. Tell us what, what's on your mind. Yeah, good evening. Leonard, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Yes, I can hear you. So, Mr. Afra is here. What do you have to say? Then I thank you very much. Eh? On my mind, no, line is not good. We we are having difficulty here, Mr. Uh, Ohene. We'll try and reconnect with him. Did you watching that clip we played earlier? Yes. Somebody said they don't have money to do anything. They have to even borrow money to come for the demonstration. Some people said they had medical bills to pay. Somebody said his wife had a miscarriage. This is very serious stuff. You've paid only 9,000. Yes. You have 58,000 people more to pay. Yes. And you are, when are you going to pay them? Bernard, you know, the truth is it, is, it is a sad, you know, situation to see some of these things. And I have personally witness some of the, the difficulties. And I can tell you, it is not something that you wish for even your worst enemy. This is a difficult situation that we find ourselves in. But be that as it may, the company also takes some time, the extra step, where need be, to reach out and help uh, people who are in very critical need. Um, it, it, yes, you may not have all the money, but sometimes situations such that you need to find money wherever possible. And, and take care of those situations. And so we have done that. But if you, if you put that aside, there are customers that we've also begun to pay. As I was explaining to you, if you look at the customer base we have, if you look at the segmentation, those with 10,000 and below make up more than half of the total customer base that we have. Right? And so this, the, the effort we are making now is towards paying those customers, at least taking care of those customers off first. So as I speak with you, those who 2,000 below, we've started the payments. I was, I was telling you that people were saying there is nothing going on, there is no payment. Look, I intentionally brought this, this file here, to show you the cost. And, and these are not just papers I've given you. These are deposit slips into the accounts of customers. These are uh, mobile So this is money. the 9,000 people you've paid? This is just a bit. I have the... the, the so the, these 9,000, have you cleared this, all this of bit. them or you have paid them part? No, some, these ones we've paid all. If you look at this, these are more transactions that we've made. We've, there are some we've paid everything. There are some we've paid up to 70%. There so when you say you've paid 9,000... Yes, you it's, are a saying, it's a mix. It's a mix. It's a mix. So you don't have any... How many have you paid everything? I don't have that specific number, but if you have somebody who has 2,000... As I talk to you, we are working on paying all those who have 2,000 and below. All right. And so far, we are, we are, we are on track. And I'm hopeful that mm. they will cover all of all right. that. This As the, we do that, I'm sure we'll be able to make some more payments. This is well. the point of view. I'm talking first to uh, Kwame Afre from Gold Coast, trying to understand the problem. Or Kofi Afre, actually. And later on, I'll be speaking to Fred Papo. Let me try and see if I can get uh, Simon again. Simon, are you on the line? Hello, Simon. So we are trying to put one of your customers on mm. the line for them to tell us directly why they were so angry as they had a demonstration. Okay. Some accuse the company of disrespect. When we read your statement to them, they said that statement didn't show respect. They say you haven't apologized to them. Yeah. So I was trying to get him to say that himself, but I'm having difficulty putting him on the line. So well, what's your answer? Ben, what, what they they else? say they feel insulted by, by the comments you've been making. And that you haven't even apologized to them. You're not, you're not empathizing with them. Bernard, it, it cannot be that we are not empathizing with them. It, it, it cannot be. I mean, Hello? These, are, these are customers we work with over the period. Unfortunately, this has happened. What we were, were unhappy about, if I may put it that way, was that, look, as long as the company is not paying or making any effort, I can tell you for a fact, 
some of those leaders in the groups, either all or part of their funds have been paid. And it was this year. Some but, but, as what, late, what does that mean? I'm coming. Some as late as July, some as late of June. I am not saying you've paid everybody, but the, the point but the fact that you've is paid, that... You, are 50, you say you have 58,000 people you've not paid. Yes. So even if 1,000 people go on the street, yes. why should the fact that you've paid somebody be an issue? But because I, you have, you've admitted that you haven't paid 58,000 people. Hold on. It is not an issue per se, but when somebody comes to say, you're not even reaching out to the person, and yet you just paid the person, what does it mean? Let, let, let me see if Simon is there for the last time. Simon, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Well, we're struggling with the line, so we'll just, we'll just leave that out. Dr. Indum put out a statement on his Facebook page today, which a lot of people felt was insensitive. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. He essentially was saying he doesn't understand why people are demonstrating when he's trying to pay them back and that there are companies that owe people who haven't even paid anything yes. and nobody's protesting against them. Mm -hmm. And then the headline that some of the uh, stories wrote was, insulting my mustache won't bring your money back. That, that sounded a bit insensitive. Well, I, I don't know if you, you've seen the statement and whether it's... I uh, haven't. And so it's a bit difficult to comment because I don't have... I, I can show background. it to you on the screen now. Yes, but you also have to so understand guys, put, that... So guys, put the statement on the screen if you have you it. You also have to understand that it's also human. Yeah. Right? There it is. Yes, that's um, the statement. So it's a long statement, yes. but essentially saying that demonstrators against payment of investment this morning... I mean, it's a long... A long sorry, but he, he essentially is almost perplexed and wondering why people even demonstrate. I mean, when, when you take a coffin and put somebody in, what does it mean? What does it mean? I'm saying he's a, you have to understand that he's not a superhuman being. He's also a human being. He has feelings. You understand? It is, it is not as if he's not being insensitive. If I tell you some of the personal things that he's done, you would, you would know that this is not somebody who will take anybody's money. So he ends or, by saying, so where from this demonstration and the attacks on my, me personally, to what? To want to destroy the very businesses customers expect their money to come from, we will continue to make planned payments until everyone is satisfied. Yes, some of some are just doing policies, with, there's no doubt, but we are serious about our business. Everyone will be paid, not everyone at once, but no one will lose their investment. As for the insults, too bad, but after all, this is the Ghana we are in. But, but, but Bernard, the last but one statement for me should be reassuring mm -hmm. that everyone will be paid, no one will lose their money. I think that should be, that for me, that would be the most important thing that I take from this. But I'm also saying that our customers can be assured. I am sorry if they feel that we haven't reached out enough to them. But I want to assure them that the company is taking every step, including the court actions we, we've already initiated, to make sure we can Do you need a bailout? Government owes us. If government owes us and they give you money, it's not a bailout. But let them bring the money. That's all. Government owes you how much? They owe us over $2 billion. If, you see, Government owes you, Gold when, Coast when $2 billion. You say, when you say government, then it is a little difficult for people to appreciate. But agencies of government who are giving contractors work that they have done. Government said by 30th October they will pay contractors the third tranche. How much? In, the, in total, government would have paid contractors at least $3 billion. Three billion. For my, know, for my interview with Abna Osei yes. Asari, yes. they are paying over 200 contractors for projects started from 2015 to 2019. 2015 to 2019. And the, the amount that they, 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 they've paid 900 million, mm -hmm. they paid 1.4 billion, mm -hmm. they are paying another 1.2 billion by end of 30th October. But, but Bernard, how much is the debt portfolio when it comes to infrastructure? So sometimes it looks why don't big, you publish the list? It. Why don't you publish the list of contractors we have. who are owed by government who owe you. We have. And what we've even done, we have the list of the projects that... And it's up we, to $2 billion. Yes. You should... You should some, the, the principal amount may not be up to $2 billion, But as long as a person raises an IPC or an interim payment certificate, it is due on government to pay. Okay. Once the government doesn't pay, it accrues right. interest as well. So if you add all of that up... What, is your, final, that, that what is your final word to your 58,000 who haven't received anything from you? 58,000 people. Ben, um, it's, it is an un unfortunate situation we find ourselves in. For a company, for me, that has created real value for people over the past 26 years. A company that, through some of the pre-financing we've done, has brought real work or development to the, some of the communities out there. It is a difficult situation. But I take consolation in the fact that we will be here to work with our customers to ensure we pay everybody and no one will lose any persona of their investment. I can only plead that anyone who owes us, be it agencies of government, be it private sector, anyone who owes us, you also make it a point to pay what is due so we can pay our customers as well. But aside that, whatever 
the shareholders, the directors, and the management of the company uh, has to do, whatever we have to do, whatever properties we have to put uh, against all these payments to ensure we can raise the funding to pay. I am very, right. very positive the company will do that. Thank you for being on the program. Kofi Afre is a spokesperson Great. for Gold Coast Fund Management. We'll take a short break. When we come back, my next guest is ready. He's been touring the country. He wants to revive Ghana football. Ironically, today is the exact 10th anniversary of our famous victory in Egypt. But some people say Ghana's football is at an all-time low. How does Fred Papo intend to redeem that? We'll be right back. Stay with us. We are still on the point of view, and it's a double barrel show. We're talking now football. So 10 years ago today, Ghana won the World Under-21 World Cup. But some people say we can't even get a friendly match. While Senegal is playing against Brazil and Nigeria is doing the same, we don't even know what our national team did. We are not even getting matches to play. So is Ghana's football at an all-time low? And is Fred Papo the man to revive it? Great to have you, Mr. Papo. My pleasure, Bernard. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I didn't know campaigning for GFA president was that serious. Every time I call you in a different region. Yeah, it didn't used to be that serious until this time around. And uh, wow. I think it's good if you're talking about the democracy in football. Uh, that's a very good sign. Mm -hmm. And then also for me, more importantly, uh, it also signifi uh, signifies an important step mm. in the rebranding or the revival process I've been talking mm. about. Even the whole process of uh, picking and choosing the president and then the executive council. Mm. In such a, an openly democratic manner, I believe it's quite a good sign. So who are the delegates? The delegates are, as per our statutes and regulations, we have uh, 120 delegates made mm. up of uh, Premier Division clubs. Premier Division clubs are the House of Fools, the Kotokos, and the rest, the Dwarfs, mm -hmm. and the rest. They have uh, two votes each. And then uh, we have Division One clubs, 48 of them. The Premier clubs are 16. And then they have to, well, that makes it 32. Then the division ones are 48. So you already have 80 over there. Then uh, two votes per regional football association. For now, we are dealing with the 10 old uh, regions. So that makes it 20, mm. 100. And then the remaining 20 are split amongst what we call the constraint bodies, professional footballers association, professional footballers, uh, coaches, referees, women, and the security services and the, and the rest. Mm -hmm. They make up 20. So, so what, are you, what are you telling these people when you, you visit them? And you've been throughout the country. What are you, what's your message? Uh, my message is simple. My message is just a confirmation of the fact that our game is down. Our brand has been bet, uh, battered. It's been bruised. It's been damaged. And for that reason, it was th that was uh, necessitated or caused by a lot of uh, problems or factors. And that situation in itself has generated a whole stream of other problems or factors, key, key among which is the loss of love from uh, Ghanaians and then the corporate world. Mm. And uh, if you're an institution with such a huge uh, economic or business potential, which is not getting the necessary mileage or leveraging the sponsorship and other business and commercial opportunities out there, then your products and your members suffer. And that is the situation in which our clubs and members find themselves now. So my message to them is to remind them and also to encourage them that much as we are down where we do not want to. We've been at a better position before. So there's a hope that with all the force of the right strategies and rest, we can lift the game or lift our brand up to the level. We are want we to. at this uh, <coughs> low point because of our NAS? Not just our NAS. The, the, the writings were clear on the wall before, before our NAS. Our NAS was actually precipitated by some factors or so. The factors were there, factors of a lack of credibility, lack of integrity in our system. Uh, manipulation of our, of our games, especially our major domestic product, which was our domestic league, mm. uh, falling standards of our national teams, a whole myriad of problems that are so many to recall. And then uh, I believe our NAS failed on the, what was permitting uh, at that time to actually cash in and then mm. uh, release. But you've been with Ghana football in one shape or form since 1991. Yeah, I've been some years before. So probably almost 30 years. I'll say so, yeah. So you're an old all, hand? All my, all my adult life, I'll say. You're a football person? Yeah. So you're an establishment candidate? So why should we I'm, believe you'll do something I'm, I'm new? Not, I'm not an establishment candidate. Uh, I've had that uh, experience and sting with Ghana football for quite some time. Mm. We were talking about the national level. 
yeah. that is uh, managing football at the national level in terms of the executive council and then the leadership level that have been there from uh, 2000 and early 2000 specifically from 2005 to 2011 as the vice president and mm. 2011 to 2015 and i'm proud to say that it the glory years of our football in recent times not to talk about the aggressions and the inf uh, inform errors and the rest by recent times at least in this century the glory years of football took place when i was very key in the system from 2006 world cup absolutely all true. the way to 2014 not uh, not to, up to 2014 i usually want to end around 2011. 2011 2014 there was a negative or so two, transition. 2006 to 2011 11. that was when that was a period we had uh, our appearance at the two world cups and then uh, we won this uh, under 20 tournament that you are talking about in, in Egypt. but you were the vice chairman at the time yeah vice I, was, president. I was the vice president at the time and then uh, after 2011 I lost my seat as a vice president, but I still remained on the executive committee as a member up to 2015. What, is, what was your relationship with Christine Yantichi, and did you fall out with him? I didn't fall out with him. We had a, we had a good cordial working relationship. We, I went for elections as a vice president. And did he support you? I do not have any reason to believe he didn't support me, but the bottom line is that uh, I lost principally because of a group of people indicated they didn't want to see my face. Apparently, they had been told by a higher body. Who it was, I don't know. Who does Nyantichi support now? Do we know? I don't know. I've, I've have been, you spoken I, to him? I've not spoken to him, I would say, for well over one and a half years plus. You haven't spoken to him for a year and a half? Yeah. Is this, is it still influential in Ghana football? Well, to the extent that one has been associated with football for some years or for some time, you, you, you build networks, you have relationships and the rest. So definitely, one could fall on those kind of relationships at any point in time. So. It will be a bit difficult to discount. Some people said he, he, had, he held the FA in his iron grip. So would an association with him be hurtful to your campaign? Because you worked with him for at least six years. My campaign? Yes, because you worked with him for at least six or seven years as his or vice. More than that. I was with him uh, way before when Dr. Nyahota Maklo was the mm. chairman of the management committee. The two of us were selected by the clubs to represent us on the management board. At the time, that was the structure. We mm. had a five-member management board, two from two nominees from government, one of whom became the president, and then the other a member. Then two from the clubs, one of whom became the vice, mm. and then the other a member. Way back in those times, and even before then, mm. I was with him on the GACA, Ghana League Clubs Association Executive Council. So we, we've had a long period of working relationship. So the question is, will that association help you or hurt you? I have not given it any thought. I, I, I believe and I'm quite confident that uh, my campaign and uh, everything is rolling on the way it is now without his association. So are you coming as a reformer or you are coming to restore the glory days? What's, what's the message? The message is restoration of the glory days. But then, you, if you look at it, apart from restoration, there's a revival. You know? So if we are able to revive it, which is very, we are able to restore it, then we'll revive and then proceed to push the association to levels beyond the best of our days. But was our glory days really glory? I've heard Neil Ante Van der Poel, for example, say that there were pressures for him to pay referees for us to win matches. Some people feel even our World Cup qualifications were not properly, um, were not based on merit because that, we were doing those, ways and means. Those are, so, 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 are, are they glory so, days? Indeed? So they believe we did ways and means to get to the World Cup and they believe we did ways and means to participate in the World Cup to, to get to the finals. Well, he we, said, did, we did ways and means to beat the Czech Republic, ways and means to beat the USA. The, no, the, he said that are, the, players were even asking to pay referees for him to qualify for 20, the, 20, 2014 20 World, World Cup. I, I, I don't know about the 2014 World Cup qualifications. I don't know much about that. But I, if can, talk, I, can, I can talk about 20, 2006 and 2010. So why have our football fortunes plummeted so much? Yeah, I think uh, we dropped our guard. We became complacent. Uh, we decided to abandon certain core principles of uh, transparency and good governance. We lost credibility. And then we started losing supporters and the love. A certain bit of arrogance also creeped in at a, at a point in time. And uh, definitely, if, if, if you, are, you are maintaining this posture where people are seeing, the thing about football is that results are always there for one to see. If, 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 if your stuff is not good, your matches and the results of your matches over a period of time will start revealing that you can never conceal it. You know, so people lost interest in our domestic competitions today. People are not interested because you went into a match and then you could clearly see 
that there was somebody who had predetermined the result or the outcome of a match. Uh, you went into a tournament or a competition where you could clearly see that certain groups of people, certain individuals had predetermined who was going to win that tournament or that competition or who should go out of it. You know, So many things. People really, even those of us in football, there were people in football who actually lost faith in the, mm. in the establishment to the extent that there were even members of the executive committee who were taking cases all the way up to cast members of the executive committee. So that should tell you what about those or those clubs or those individuals who do not even have people in places of authority. So definitely there, 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 there were quite a lot. So of what will you do? Because don't forget, during the announced revelations, referees were taking bribes, matches were being fixed, players were paying to get into national teams. As FA chairman, what, how powerful are you and what can you do? Uh, a lot of things can be done as, a, uh, as the FA president in the, uh, in the sense that you being a leader. You have a team of uh, executives as the executive mm. council to reform and then put in place new ideas. For example, we are going to operate with a new set of statutes which was uh, formulated and agreed upon at the Congress on the 5th of September. Mm. It has a lot of very interesting and clear provisions which seek to project and protect good corporate, corporate governance. We would have to, if I'm voted in office, we would have to religiously comply and abide by those tenets, as a, even as a minimum. Mm. Uh, there are quite a lot of, we're talking about officiating. There are a lot of programs that we, we have done, my team and I have done a very critical analysis of why we have that problem in terms of officiating. It's, there, are, there are two sides of it. The conditions under which our referees work for sometimes are a bit chaotic. We mm -hmm. do expose them. We give them quite a huge exposure to, to corrupt, uh, corruption and manipulation. For example, uh, I think they can officiate for about two or three seasons without them being paid any monies. Mm. They sometimes use their own funds to try uh, pick transport to the centers, and then to and from the centers and back. We have an arrangement where the referees go to a center, and it's the home team who picks him and uh, holds the referee. We are all Ghanaians, Bernard. You go to somebody, <laughs> he picks you from the new plant station or wherever it is, sends you to your hotel, which is going to book feeds you breakfast, lunch, supper, and then extends a whole lot of other cases. Then the following day, you go and stand in the, in the middle of the pitch, officiating a match between your benefactor and another. These are who people would argue back that uh, that is how it's done in CAF and FIFA. And the but it's done in FIFA and CAF, whilst at the same time, there are very clear assessment and monitoring uh, systems. Mm. The FIFA match commissioner is a match commissioner in every sense of the word. You cannot just say the same about what we have in Ghana. The FIFA match assessor is an assessor in the true sense of the word. So even if you extended all those cases to a referee, he knows that that should not be the reason for him not to be fair. Mm. You know? So these are other, the other sides of the equation. We are going to look at those things very well. Uh, there's, a, there's a recommendation, strong recommendation, where we would ag aggressively seek to rebrand ourselves would aggressively market and seek for sponsorship, convince, uh, what do you call it, sponsors of our credibility, of our, our, of our new incredi uh, credibility, to the extent that they'll be comfortable with their funds being lodged with the FA. They'll be comfortable with mm. associating themselves with the FA as a brand. This is the point mm -hmm. of view. We're talking to Fred Papo, who is uh, an aspirant to be FA president. When we come back, we'll try and reminisce what happened in 2009, 10 years ago today. How the day are you led us to a famous World Cup. What has changed? How come the contrast between 2009 World Cup and 2014 Brazil fiasco? And what will it do different? Stay with us. All right, welcome back. This is The Point of View. My guest for now is Fred Papu. Earlier on, I had Kwame, Kofi Afre, who is from Gold Coast. Lots of comments coming for Kofi Afre. People are not happy with him. Uh, Bernard, I'm glad Mr. Benjamin Afre said that they are waiting for government to pay the contractors before they settle some of their aggrieved customers. Hopefully, the government will clear the funds for the contracts. Miftal from Tamale. Uh, Stephen Buedi says they should stop saying that government owes them. They give money to contractors, not government. Bernard, you talk about risk management, and yet you give all investment to one government. Frederick Osebuns, who wants to know. Ben, asking why they accepted more money in July when they knew their problems had already started. Ezekiel, Ezekiel Kweku Jr. Uh, Mr. Afre has already left here. We'll continue this discussion on other platforms. My guest here is Fred Papu. 2009, was it a golden generation? 
Andre Ayu was the captain. Ajiman Bedu was there. John, Jonathan Mensa was there. These are the same boys who went to South Africa 2010, predominantly, to get into the quarterfinal. What was different about that group? I think if we're talking about a, a golden generation, I would say that would be the generation of, uh, was it 2001 or so, the uh, under-20 squad that went to Argentina and won uh, silver or bronze. Mm -hmm. The squad with uh, John Mensa, John Pencil, Emmanuel Papo, Derek, uh, Derek Barty, Mike Ellis, Suleiman that, that, that The Liberty uh, Corps. The, the, yeah, that, that group. I think that was, that, that was a, the, the strong group. And they were the backbone of the 2006-2010 World Cup. Now, that particular group, I can't exactly recall, but uh, at the under-20 level, they qualified for the World Cup. I believe even in uh, 1999, they went to the under-17 World Cup. I don't know, at 20 level, they went to the World Cup again in Argentina, and then they won uh, silver. In 2004, they qualified for the Olympic Games, mm. and uh, we got eliminated uh, at the preliminary stages in a very funny and very chaotic way when Japan, who were, who were losing to everybody, decided to beat us. <laughs> uh, that was in 2004 for mm. the Olympic Games, the same squad. Then in 2006, the same squad once again qualified us for the first ever World Cup. And they were around again in 2010, they, they, not just qualifying for the World Cup, but they went and performed very creditably. We came out of our group, which had the second best team in the world at the time, fifth best team in the world at the time, and the 11th best team in the world at the time. We went in as the 45th or 50th best team in the world, but we managed to sell through. I'm talking about a group with uh, Italy, Czech Republic, and the USA. We qualified together with, I think, uh, Italy. Now, Italy eventually became the winners of that tournament, mind you. And uh, they were the only ones who beat us at the preliminary stage. Then in 2010, we went again all the way up to the quarterfinals with these guys forming the bulk of the group. So, and Montari, Essien, John Mensa, Adokwe Papo, Jonathan, John Pencil. These are the... the, what, uh, the that's the golden generation to me, to for me, you. To me, to me, because they, they, they qualified for every single... The ultimate tournament in, in their various age competitions. And I seen it. Was Asamwajan part of that group? Or he was a bit. Asamwajan Asamwa was a junior to in them. that group. Uh, he was one of the younger guys in that group at the time. Some people and think then, we keep players in the Black Stars for too long. If they are performing well, why, why, why shouldn't they be, uh, they be in the Black Stars? Uh, but the thing is that what you are saying is a bit tricky in the sense that the coaches should not assume mm. that the players have a regular pride of place in the squad. Their placing in the squad should be subjected to strict monitoring and assessment. Mm. You know, when you do that, you will get to know that this man is dropping in form. But sometimes the coaches, you know, you would like they pick the, the, four, the sheets of paper and blah, 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 blah. They know some people who definitely have to be there. They do not even care whether they are fit or whatever it is. So uh, it's one thing which should be looked at very, very, very properly. Mm. Who is your main contender? I have uh, five now. Mm. There are five contenders. Uh, whose name are you hearing when you go on the streets? When you campaign, whose, whose name is disturbing you? I don't get disturbed. I think uh, uh, some have chosen to to canvas or campaign along lines that are unknown to us uh, with posters on trotters and taxis and things like that, which I find very interesting. And, How much and, money and, are you uh, spending? Oh, reasonably practical money for the practical things like running around, transportation, hotel. Do you have to pay hotel, delegates? Hotel, I don't have that capacity and I don't have that belief. Do they demand pay. money? No. Nobody will demand, sure. money. Nobody will demand money from people. Are, are some of your contenders giving money? I don't know, but I understand uh, one of the uh, contenders reported to FIFA or whatever it is that he or she had seen uh, contenders giving money. Or whatever. I don't know what came out of that case, but I haven't seen any. Are the, vote, are the delegates viable? Are the, what kind of people are voting? Uh, because we hear viable, that, they, they, so as, as in political parties, the delegates are a certain caliber. So, so for example, for the clubs, who represents them? Who's voting? The clubs will choose who should go vote for them. Some clubs will choose their owners, they, they, they ultimately the biggest shots in the club. Others may choose their reps, or others may choose anyone in between, maybe someone they trust or whatever it is to go and vote for them. So it's not something that you can clearly see or know. But then we have the list of delegates out there. Uh, who will be voting. Most of them, I believe, are club owners and a few. Uh, I hear BA has the most delegates. 
BA will all together have about 20 votes out of the 120. Two from the Regional Football Association, about eight from the Premier, four Premier clubs over there, and then the rest from the yeah. uh, what they call the Division One, and then the women's. While we're at it, I'm showing the, the penalty shootout there. Some people feel that this this team didn't do much after 2009. That having won the World Cup, you would expect some of the players like Ransford said, Dominique Dia, to go on to become world beaters. Apart from Andre Ajiman Bedu and a couple others, the rest of them didn't really, maybe Jonathan Mensa, a lot mm -hmm. of them didn't really live up to what happened? Uh, sometimes it has to do with the career paths of the, of the players. For example, you mentioned uh, Dominica Dia. He went straight to the AC Milan also. Sometimes if you start too high and then you cannot maintain it also, your, your progression might be a bit, a bit funny. Then uh, others too, such as uh, Jonathan Mensah and the rest. Jonathan Mensah, he did. He... They, yeah, they, played, uh, they, they, they had a modest progression, so it was a bit more steady. And then up to now, you still find them on the pitch. I, I believe career progression and management. What do you management. think of Andre? No, Andre, 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 Andre has really, I, be, I believe, he's fulfilled his potential as a footballer, very committed footballer, very, very disciplined and determined and focused footballer. You know, the thing about Andre is that he's got quite a good level of ambition. I remember this squad. When they were there in 2009 uh, in Egypt, I think they were in this Maria or whatever it is, a problem arose in the camp and then uh, I was mandated to go in there to try to solve the problem. So when I went in, I spoke with their management and everything, things were okay. So I wanted to see the players. The first player I went to was Andre, who was the captain then. When That was 2009. Uh, may have been October, right? Yeah. So when I went in, so we started giving by so blah, 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 blah. I said, Child, what they go, what they go on? Charlie, so they work up, how would they prepare for him? Mm. I, I then I asked him, which can work up? I said, so Charlie, no be uh, South Africa 2010. He was then in the hotel room with the under 20, they had Already thinking there. about South Africa 2010. thinking about South Africa 2010. Very ambitious. Yeah, so I just told my friend, make you cover your skin. I'm here to see how we can solve this way. So this one, they will go solve and they'll be the the South Africa with the matter. You know, that's, that's Andrea you for you. And I'm not surprised he's raising all, the, all, all, all this while 10 years after that, he's a skipper of the Black Stars. Do the players accept him as a captain? I Have they so. accepted I him think, now? I think so. I think so. I haven't been close to the, the senior national team now, but I, I would want to believe they have. I don't, I don't know. But How I, has Chrissy appeared then as national team coach? I think to the extent that uh, Ghanaians expect all their national teams to win matches at any tournament, they, they, to win the tournament, any tournament they enter in, definitely I'm sure Chrissy has fallen below the expectations in one way or the other. But then... The circumstances within which he operates sometimes would have to be looked at quite well. But I still believe that uh, he still has a bit more to offer Ghanaians. Olu Femi Olu Shambles wants me to ask you, what's the difference between Fred Papo running for GFA president now and Fred Papo, who was vice president at Kwesi Nyantichi, as someone who works with the former GFA boss, doesn't he think it's a big minus as he runs for this position? No, not at all. Uh, you would have to look at the period of time that I worked for Kwesi Nyantechi and what happened that I worked with Kwesi Nyantechi, not for him. And uh, what happened during that period in terms of uh, achievements and the rest and what happened after I, I had left the scene. I think people should look at those, those things. I left in 2015. I was there from 2005 to 2015 or 2005 to 2011 with respect to the vice. And then I left. So when, when the Brazil debacle happened, you were not... I was nowhere near the same. I wasn't even in Brazil. As a matter of fact, I, I turned down every single opportunity to be near the team in Brazil. Would it would 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 the three million have been put on the plane as with you being vice chairman or vice president? Could would that have happened? I I doubt. Maybe I would have staged uh, I would have protested against it. That is if we had gotten to know that that was going to happen. Maybe I would have made a few points known to my colleagues that look these things are not really... But was it a player-instigated move or the officials also wanted it? Uh, you, you would have to look at who stood to benefit from the, from, the, from the money that was being flown in. And everybody stood to benefit. Even if the officials had no hand in it, at least they, for the very reason that people would be thinking they had a hand in it, they should have been pressed upon whoever it was to take it easy. But the fact that they kept quiet, that is what has led to people believing that they, they were expecting something from that. That's why... They and that, that report 
has not been implemented. The Jamaica report. I, I don't think it's been implemented in many ways. Even some of the, the recommendations that they give in terms of payment and cash and the uh, Ghana citizen, quite a number of their recommendations I don't think have been respected. Would you, would you pledge to champion its implementation? It wouldn't be within my power. But in terms of championing, at least there are some clauses or recommendations that are within the power of the FA Executive Council to implement. Mm. Those ones we will do. But those that are in the purview of the government and the judiciary, that one I will not have any much hand in that. Good luck. We wish you well. Thank you very much, Bernard. They call him Papse, and everybody calls him Vice P. He is the former Vice President of the GFA, gunning to be President. He's been my second guest on the point of view. Earlier on, I had Kofi Afre from Gold Coast. If you are part of the 58,000, he says he will pay you in the next two or three years. If government pays everything, they would pay. We'll keep the story running. Thank you for watching tonight's edition of Point of View. Stay tuned to CCTV. See you next time. Hi, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video on CCTV's YouTube channel. Subscribe for more videos on the point of view. My name is Bernard Avale. Thank you.